look at that, the amazing yeah, human body. The head, the ear, the neck, the shoulder. The arm, the elbow, the wrist, the, the finger, the knee, the shin, the toe. Look at all the bones inside. There's all the blood vessels. There's all the guts. Those are the guts. Those are your guts. That's right. That's right. And here it goes. That's the vagina. Yes, that's it. Er zijn weinig wetenschappers die zo vreemd en tegelijk zo aanstekelijk kunnen verhalen over heel het raadsel dat ons omringt en waarvan wij zelf de uitdrukking zijn, ook al weten we niet wat we uitdrukken. Er zijn weinig wetenschappers die daarover zo aanstekelijk, absurd en met een prettig gevoel voor humor kunnen vertellen als Freeman Dyson. Toen ik Dyson uitnodigde, wist ik niet beter of daarover zou het gaan. De schoonheid en troost van het universum. De schittering van de wetenschap. Right. Like little... You know, you know, you know people to read about bodies. Good. The most exciting thing is in a way gamma ray bursts. Because that is still a total mystery. These are the most violent events in the whole universe. So they are not particularly consoling. They are just mysterious. These are monstrously energetic, monstrously fast. Something like a whole... Exciting. No, simply the speed at which the energy is dispersed into the universe. Within a fraction of a second, so more energy is released than the sun in, in puts out in its whole life. So nobody knows where they are or what they are or how they are or why they are. So that's exciting. That keeps us all, it's not, not so much beautiful because we don't know enough yet to say whether it's beautiful, we don't. But it's, it's beautiful that the universe still has so many secrets. Dit soort verhalen verwachtte ik. De zonsverduistering die hij zag in North Carolina, zo'n kwart eeuw geleden, ook daarover zouden we praten. Schoonheid en troost, niet waar? Well, it is the most majestic spectacle that, that there is. I think there's nothing greater than that as far as I know that nature has to offer. It's uh, this, this extraordinary reversal of nature when in the middle of a bright summer day, suddenly it grows dark and the, the birds stop flying around. The animals are all quiet. And it gets darker and darker, and then suddenly, there you see it, this silvery <coughs> ring around the black moon. And you see the stars, or at least a few of the stars coming, coming in, the, in, the, in the dark sky, you see. At least we saw several planets. And then in five minutes it's over, and life continues. But that's something you don't forget. The kind of sheer beauty. Yes, and, and the, 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 the strangeness of it. It is as if the normal processes of nature suddenly were interrupted. We zouden elkaar ontmoeten in Princeton, op het terrein van het Institute for Advanced Study waar hij al zo'n 30 jaar woont en werkt. Heilige grond. Hier zijn natuurwetten uitgedacht. Hier vonden de besprekingen plaats over de eerste atoombom. Einstein woonde er. Oppenheimer. Zo ongeveer alles wat de afgelopen eeuw heeft voortgebracht... aan natuur, schei en wiskundigen, verbleef hier ooit. Ik dacht vooraf, ook daarover zal het deels gaan. Over de genieën waarmee Dyson samenwerkte en over de intrigerende verschijningen 
waarmee hij nu omgaat. I think of Stephen Hawking, who is one of my heroes, and of course, I mean, it's the most marvelous thing that we have been friends of Stephen Hawking for 30 years, and now suddenly the world has discovered him, and he's suddenly become an international figure, and he deserves it so much. It is, it, I, I'm just so delighted. He's in, totally imprisoned. He has. He cannot speak, he cannot move his legs and arms, he can move just two fingers, that's all the communication he has with the outside world. Just with two fingers he can do everything that he does. And uh, as a result of that he thinks deeply and he has probably become a much greater scientist than he would have been otherwise. And that's what he says himself, that in many ways it's an advantage to be isolated the way he is isolated. Quite an amazing character. Dit soort verhalen zouden in het verschiet liggen. Zoals ik me had voorbereid op een lang gesprek over het fenomeen schoonheid. Had hij me niet al geschreven we weten van alles over de schoonheid van de wetenschap. Maar we weten niets van de wetenschap van de schoonheid. Ik wist niet beter of daarover zou het vooral gaan. Hij zou de pracht van verre melkwegstelsels beschrijven... en hier op aarde de schoonheid van de bergen, waar hij zo van houdt. Het leek volmaakt vanzelfsprekend. Beauty. It's something you feel, you can't explain. But what you're saying that if I come up with a series of beauty and consolation, you say you don't know what you're talking about. Precisely, yes. As far as, as any scientific understanding goes. I mean, we know what we're talking about because we can feel it ourselves, but, but we cannot explain it. And, You don't have the slightest idea why we, uh, this species, experience beauty, and why beauty in itself can be considered. No, I think the what is known about the structure of our brains is very little, and but, but we do know that the limbic system is older than the cortex. Yeah. And, I mean, the, and roughly speaking, the limbic system is concerned with emotions, and the cortex is concerned with images and thoughts. So it implies somehow that emotions are older than in intelligence. So I, I, and that I probably d does mean something. It, it probably means that the emotions were absolutely essential for living before intelligence mm -hmm. arose. And so what we have, we could not be intelligent without the emotions, I think, is very likely. At least not the way we are built. No, where does beauty fit in? Well, that we don't know, except that it seems very likely that, in some sense, the feeling of beauty was older than the understanding of what arouses it. But you say that we know more about the universe than we know about our sense of beauty and why it exists. Yes, of certainly that's true. We know a huge amount about the universe. We know zero about how the sense of beauty functions. We don't know anything. Not even where it's we don't know where it's located in the brain. We don't know how it's switched on or off. We know essentially zero. Even psychologists on the level of just description know very little about it. That's strange, isn't it? It's kind yes, of it implies that it is somehow a very basic function of the organism which comes even before language 
it's so basic that we have no words really to express it. Eerst waren er de emoties. Ver daarna kwamen de woorden en het besef. De woorden zijn nog veel te jong om de emoties te kunnen verklaren. Aha, dit soort bespiegelingen. Dat was wat ik in gedachten had. Het hele fenomeen schoonheid nou eens van een andere kant bekeken. Niets weten we ervan. We weten niet eens of we de enige diersoort zijn die schoonheid kan ervaren. Of dat andere soorten het ook doen en misschien wel beter. Ik wist dat Dyson van vogels houdt. Ook daarover zou het dus even gaan. Alles leek duidelijk van tevoren. Do animals have fun or do animals experience beauty? What do you think? Yes, we cannot possibly know. And, and I mean, of course, this has always been a, a riddle. I remember, I mean, this lovely line of Blake. How do we know but that every bird flies through the air is not a huge world of delight closed to our senses five. And I think somehow you have the impression birds do have it. Just when you see them flying around in the flocks. I, I saw them the other day here. A huge flock of starlings flying around in wonderful ballet movements. Thousands of birds all flying together. And you had the feeling they must be doing this somehow from a feeling of beauty. You cannot imagine that it had any particularly practical purpose. We have the idea that we are getting more and more sensitive concerning beauty in the course of evolution. That we don't know. No. Possibly the chimpanzee may be more sensitive than we are. We don't know. I, mean, I spent a wonderful week up in the Northern Islands last summer with my son George chasing whales. And there is an expert on whales, I would say a whale worshipper up there in Canada called Paul Spong who maintains a, 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 a kind of whale watching station that's on an island which he owns and he has large numbers of hydrophones in the water mm -hmm. so you can hear the, wave, the whales conversation and there are about a hundred whales which reside nearby they, they are essentially permanent residents there and he knows each one individually. They are all identified and he can recognize their voices. And he's been listening to their conversations for about 30 years. He hasn't the faintest idea what they're talking about. But they are talking. They're talking, no doubt. And all day long they are talking. But nobody has come close to understanding the language. He's probably the one who has studied them the most. And he quite freely says that I understand nothing. Mm -hmm. All he can do is just record what, what they say, but hope that one day we shall understand it. Misschien had ik Dyson juist hierom uitgenodigd. Hij is een wetenschapper die niet hoog van de toren blaast over wat we allemaal weten. Hij is juist gefascineerd door wat we niet begrijpen. Daarover zouden we het hebben. Nederigheid. The universe doesn't necessarily follow our preferences about what it should consider beautiful. Particularly that's true of the particles. In many ways, the particle physics has grown uglier and uglier the deeper it gets. I mean, that's the way nature is. What you're saying is, we want to find a world of particles that is ordered, elegant, aesthetic, explains the beginning of the universe and the end of it. And what we are finding is a kind of rainwood of misunderstandings. Well, no, we find simply that our prejudices aren't shared by nature, that... Uh, <laughs> 
But I mean, you have to blame the experimenters for that, really. I mean, the, 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 the theories always try to be beautiful, and then they. <laughs> and there comes a guy. Experiments. And just, yeah. Spoil it by showing nature is not that way. It, 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 so again and again, nature turns out to be le less elegant or less symmetrical than we thought. But we want the world to be symmetrical, ordered, beautiful. Some of us do. And yeah. I'm sort of on the side of nature myself. And <laughs> what I would hope is that there will always be loose ends that we cannot tie down, trickier than we can understand. Mm -hmm. I would find that much more exciting than having a final theory. I would hope that in a certain way that nature is inexhaustible, that uh, and that's certainly consistent with everything we've seen so far. The further we go, the more complicated it gets. And so that, although it's true that the, the theories in themselves are very beautiful, but so nature always has the last laugh. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and during your career, nature was laughing. Yes. Time and again. Yes. And then we would talk further about the nature of Waarom ze zo vaak juist niet aan ons verlangen naar schoonheid en ordening voldoen. Om af en toe lukraak wat zijbaden in te slaan. Bijvoorbeeld naar Dyson's vader, de componist. Dyson zal geduldig naar de muziek van zijn vader luisteren. Terwijl hij intussen wil dat deze film over iets heel anders gaat. Hij beseft allang dat we zo meteen over een nieuw moeten beginnen. <laughs> a merchant was there with a fork and beard. <laughs> this the merchant is one of the favorite pieces and each of these characters can be seen all around us. I mean, We haven't changed in 500 years. No. And of course, Chaucer had a tremendous sense of humor. En ten slotte, ten slotte zouden we het over God hebben. Het eind van de film stond vast nog voor er een meter film verschoten was. Goddank had Dyson die andere film in gedachten. Een film die ook met God zal eindigen, maar op een geheel andere manier. Over een klein uur zal hij met zijn versie van het scheppingsverhaal aankomen. Maar nog enkele minuten praten we over religie in de verkeerde film, zogezegd. De vraag wat is de purpose in het universum, als er is one and is quite disconnected with knowing the laws of physics. So I always say there are two windows to look out on the universe. One is science and the other is religion. But you can't look out through both windows at the same time. Well, you're looking out of the window of science. What do you see? Well, then you see all this marvelous construction which, with, with, with a very, very beautifully balanced processes going on, which we're gr gradually learning to understand. And, and I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a, an exceedingly beautiful landscape. We can admire it and we can enjoy it, but it has nothing to do with meaning and purpose. And you look through a religious window and you see the same universe as having some purpose and having some beauty of a different kind, which again, we don't understand, but we can still feel it. But the tools are completely different. I mean, the tools of science are mostly instruments and mathematics, and the tools of religion are
words and music and companionship and so that they both uh, to me they both have a sort of equal claim to be real really yes but one shouldn't mix them up and Goed, tot zover de film die wel gedraaid werd, maar die er feitelijk niet toe doet. Hij weerspiegelt fragmentarisch waar ik het over had willen hebben. Maar Dyson, die had me van tevoren meegedeeld. Als je hier naar Princeton komt, mag je alles aansnijden. Ik zal je niet in de weg zitten. Maar als je het over schoonheid en troost wilt hebben, staat er wat mij aangaat slechts één punt op de agenda. Kinderen en kleinkinderen. Ik schreef terug, erg vind ik het niet, maar wel vreemd. Straks loop ik daar rond in Princeton met een van de meest eminente natuurkundigen van de laatste eeuw. En die heeft het dan niet over de heilige grond waarop we ons bevinden. Niet over de Andromeda-nevel of de schoonheid van Einstein's vergelijkingen. Nee, je wilt het dus hebben over je familie. Enfin, het is jouw keus, ik kom. PS, als het dan toch over het familieleven gaat... Kun je dan zorgen dat er wat kinderen en kleinkinderen komen binnenvallen tijdens ons onderhoud? Dyson antwoordde per omgang. Hij zond een verhaal van negen kantjes, getiteld Van de schoonheid en de troost over kinderen en kleinkinderen. Daarbij de mededeling. Immer zal er zijn twee dochters komen langs en tenminste drie kleinkinderen. Skeleton, that's what the skeleton is. That's all the bones together. Uh, 206 bones inside your body. 206 bones? Yes, 206. And that's what you'd look like if you didn't have any bones. You'd just be a bag of jelly. A heap of wobbly jelly. That would, if you didn't have bones to hold you up. We would see you. A bag of jelly. That's how it is. Green slime, yes. There are 206 bones inside your body. Daddy, Grandpa, to help you with that, please. In all shapes and sizes. They join together to make a skeleton. Your skull is like a crash helmet. The top of your arm bone fits into a hollow. Yes. I really do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Freeman Dyson, de natuurkundige, zal hier in zijn woonkamer in Princeton het verhaal voorlezen dat hij schreef over schoonheid en troost. Getiteld Over kinderen en kleinkinderen. Hier zullen zijn vrouw Imme, een van zijn dochters en drie van zijn kleinkinderen aanschuiven, die hij ook nog eens zal voorlezen uit Oude Schildpad. En tussen de bedrijven door praten we soms even samen. Our five-year-old grandson Randall is swinging on a swing in the playground. He is thinking and we don't disturb his thoughts. After a while he announces his verdict. I think I would rather be an egg than a chicken. Just at that moment, a large fire truck approaches and the fire crew attaches it to a hydrant. This is a novice crew with an instructor teaching them how to handle the equipment. They are not yet ready to tackle a real fire. Quickly they roll out the fire hoses and begin squirting water into the neighboring woods. Randall and his brothers rush to join the action. The opportunity to pursue further the philosophy of eggs and chickens is lost. A year earlier, Randall is silent in the back of the car, while my wife and I are sitting in front. The grown-ups are talking about trivialities, about the groceries we're on our way to buy, and the probability of finding a convenient parking place. When there's a pause in our chatter, we hear the voice of the philosopher in the back of the car. He says with a tone of triumph, God is dead! We ask him what led to this conclusion, and he has a logical answer prepared. Well, we become spirits when we're dead, and God is a spirit, so God must be dead. Then we arrive at the grocery store, 
and trivial pursuits distract our attention. We don't have time to explore the implications of God's death. Only one thing is clear to us. Randall thought of this by himself. He has not been reading Nietzsche. It is likely that his thought was guided not so much by the logical argument as by resentment against God's intrusiveness. He knows that he has a good side and a bad side, and that in spite of good intentions, the bad side often prevails. He resents the fact that God spies on him all the time. God is invading his privacy, and he needs to keep his thoughts private. It's hard enough to be the oldest of three brothers without having to deal with God in addition. With a sense of relief and liberation, he declares God dead and regains his privacy. Freeman, how do they differ, the three of them? What kind of personalities are they? Yeah, well, of course, Randall, I, I know Randall much better. And we, yes, we play chess. Uh, Randall can play chess with me and, and that, that and, checkers. and checkers. And the others, of course, I, I, I never get them one at a time, or almost uh, very rarely. Mm -hmm. You can't do so much. Yeah. Whoops, that's the telephone, that's, that's all right. Would anybody like to have Grandpa read a book to you? Would you enjoy, enjoy shall I go out? Well, what about the old turtle, is that any good? Oh, I know Wonderful. where it is. Oh, yeah. we love the old turtle. Good. Sometime earlier, Randall is sitting in the bathtub in our home. The bathtub is a good place for thinking. After a silence, he asks, does the devil have a brother? My wife replies, no, I don't believe so. Randall is quiet for a while. Then he says, that would be double trouble for the world. Once, long, long ago, and it's somehow not so very long, when all the animals and rocks, look at the pictures, the pictures are beautiful in this book. There's the animals and the rocks. When all the animals and rocks and winds and waters and trees and birds. And fish. Good, so you can read too, that's good. You can help read. Wait, wait. Could speak and understand one another. There began an argument. It began softly at first, quiet as the first breeze that whispered. He is a wind who is never still. Quiet as the stone that answered, he is a great rock that never moves. Gentle as the mountain that rumbled, God is a snowy peak high above the clouds. If I talk about beauty and consolation in your childhood or early childhood, even if the memories aren't true, we don't care about that anymore after 50. Yeah, well, let's begin with the total solar eclipse in 1927. That's something I do remember. I was furious at my father because he wouldn't take us to see it. And, and that was when I was three and a half. And it's my first really clear memory of this anger against my father. We had the eclipse in Winchester, which is in the south of England. So we could see the three quarters eclipse sun, which of course was exciting. But we knew that if we had only gone 200 miles to the north, to, to Yorkshire, we could have seen it total. And my father didn't think it was worth the trouble to drive 200 miles. But you were two, three and a half years old? I was old, three and a half, yes. Realizing what an eclipse was? Oh, of course we knew what it was. We saw it, of course, and only it wasn't total. And that was, that, that was his fault, that we, were, we weren't taken to Yorkshire where we could have seen it total. So at that point, I asked my father, when is the next one in England? And he told me, August the 9th, 1999. And I said, I'm going to see the next one. And so after 72 years, maybe I really will see it. It is, it's, it's, it's now two years from now. There will be the next total eclipse in England. Yeah. So that's something I've always been staying alive. I wanted to live long enough at least to see the next one. This is Beauty and Consolation, the eclipse in 99. Perhaps we will, we will see. I mean, in the meantime, I have seen one which was also marvelous. That was about 20 years ago when our daughters were small 
and we took four of our kids and we all drove down to that was North Carolina uh-huh. And there we saw a magnificent to- total, the real thing, the total eclipse. And I remember when we were one one time, I don't know how old I was, not older than these these guys, but, um, you know, being woken up in the middle of the night and dragged outside, and we had to run down the hill and look at the comet going by, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the night, and we were freezing. So, yeah, I mean, they took us all the way down to North Carolina to see the, you know, the uh, solar eclipse. Were you interested? Or it not? was neat. Yeah, it was. It was. It was, of course, spectacular. You know, and although we didn't, you know, at that age, really appreciate it. But I mean, it was something really fantastic. I mean, I still remember. You know, it must have been pretty. You know, I remember the comet too, the little tiny comet. <laughs> that was probably. It was probably was I think it was Kubitek. Yeah, we all had to rush down and see it. Yes, it was very. Yes. It was freezing in the middle of the night. It was a punishment. I was there too. Hello, hello, hello. And you know, of course, the way that he's thinks of it, we expected to see this huge comet go by, and it was this little tiny. <laughs> <laughs> well, he saw it huge. She thought it was huge. To him, it is. And it is beautiful. Now I appreciate it. When this comet went by recently, I was, oh, wow, that's so fascinating. Uh-huh. Does he behave differently now he's a grandfather? Compared well, to how he behaved when you were growing up. No, now he invites the grandchildren to come and look in his telescope, and we've, we've looked at the moon here through the telescope. Right, Randy, you did with Grandpa. Remember? The that big telescope. telescope is mine. Yes, it you really have a telescope. Yeah, Grandpa, Grandpa got him a telescope. Yes, no. It's mine. And it is true. Yes, it's your true. We we should get to use it more. I'm so lazy. It's mine and Grandpa's. It's mine oh, and Grandpa's. Telescope. No, that is so certainly. Look at it. Look at things together. That is a deterioration. I used to take the telescope out much more when I was young. Yes. With children or? Yes. With yeah. the children. Oh, yes. Yes, but it, it's mat- that's just a matter of being tough. In those days, I didn't mind getting frozen. <laughs> did you, did you look through the telescope with Granddad or not? Did I you look at the stars? Did you? Did you? Did you guys did yes. Yeah. What did you see? I saw, like, stars and stuff and the moon. And I've also something else to say. I think he likes to read. That's right. Beauty and consolation are the gifts that children bring into the lives of parents and grandparents. People without children find other beauties and other consolations, but children are the most universal sources of beauty and consolation, available to educated and uneducated, to sophisticated and primitive, to rich and poor alike. Human beings of all cultures and races have this in common. Our biological heritage imposed on us an imperative to love and nurture and educate our children. Raising and educating children are the most important things that our evolution has designed us to do. To raise children is exhausting, to educate them is difficult. Evolution has given us the reward of joy to help us endure the pain of child rearing and the tedium of education. We would not fulfill our roles as guardians of the young if the young didn't fill our hearts with joy. It's no accident that we find their bodies beautiful and their minds miraculous. It's no accident that we find consolation for the sorrows of the world in watching their bodies grow and their minds unfold. I got a note from Max on my fax machine. Would you, would you imagine? And you know, I was very tired when I read it. I read it over and over. But you know what I think it said? I will show it to you later. I really think it said, I love you. <laughs> and I saw the, the, the answer you wrote. Yes. But I will show it to you. Do oh. you spell I love you? Listen, do you spell it Z? Mm. No. No. Do you? <laughs> well, that's the kind of stuff that arrived. That was I written think by his, Max. Max's little hand just went wham, 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 right? And sent a note to Omi. I thought it said, I love you, just the way I love you. Just don't, don't stand in front of it, just you can look at it from the side. Ready? You want to be where? I don't remember my mother except with gray hair. She was already 43 when I was born. And 
So she was in a way more of a grandmother than a mother. Mm -hmm. But still, we were very close, and of course we talked endlessly about science, about literature, about music, about everything. That was, but it was on a rather an intellectual level. They were not, and neither of them were sort of the young parents who would play around with the kids. My father liked to play with us in moderation, and, but it was mostly uh, more outdoor pursuits. I mean, I remember he made a toboggan that we could slide down on. Uh, so he was sometimes a companion. My mother never would do anything like that, as far as I remember. So they were rather more intellectual parents than physical parents. But certainly we were treated well, and they took a lot of trouble to educate us and to make sure that we got plenty of books to read. And they, so on an intellectual level... Everything was OK. We had a very good childhood, yes, and we, we certainly were close. My mother was a lawyer and my father was a musician. And they, both of them had wide interests. So the books on the shelves were about science and other things besides just law and music. And yeah, intellectually it was okay. Very good. Emotionally, yes. emotionally we had to go elsewhere. I mean, it was. I was much you know, emotionally. I was closer to my sister than to my mother. Mm -hmm. My sister is still very close. She's three years older than I am, so she, in a way, was my substitute mother. What kind of a father was Freeman? We t were talking about his parents, and he described them as a kind of, well, intellectual, kind, yeah, but is, cold. Yes, this is what I believe very much. That is really what they were. I mean, deep in, they were very loving parents, but they did not express this. I mean, they, I never really saw them grow up. I saw Freeman every once while taking his hand and sort of holding his mother's hand, and she was obviously enjoying that, but she didn't return it. She just held very still, and, and you could somehow feel something very satisfying going through her, you know, her, her body. Um, I think that's true, that's how they were. But I, I, I think in a way Freeman was a more outgoing father. I mean, there were many things he, he, he didn't do with them. I mean, he, he uh, I mean, he, he just, he wouldn't go out and actually kick a ball around or really race around with them. It, again, for him, life with the children is much more an intellectual you know, adventure where um, you know you love reading to them, you absolutely love to hear them talk and and so on. But but if they spill a little milk it's a little, you know, tougher. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <Then what? laughs> well, I mean it's uh, you know they know very well that grandpa will really sort of make a very fierce face if the milk goes over the table and so on. But still they love him very much. And the fish in the ocean, look at the fish in the ocean, answered, God is a swimmer in the dark blue depths of the sea. I think they are sharks, perhaps. Big ones, I'm not sure. No, said the star, God is a twinkling and a shining far, far away. No, replied the ant. God is, a, God is a sound and a smell and a feeling who is very, very close. God, insisted the antelope, is a runner swift and free who loves to leap and race with the wind. So there's the antelope. They can run so fast. She is a great tree, murmured the willow, a part of the world, always growing and always giving. You are wrong, said the island. God is separate and apart. God is like the shining sun, far above all things, said the blue sky. No, he is a river who flows through the very heart of things, thundered the waterfall. There's the waterfall. Did you miss that kind of caring from the part of your mother? Not, I don't think much. I think she probably missed it more than I did, because I had her and she only had a kid brother. Mm -hmm. Are you very different? Yes. Educating your own children? Oh, you mean, am I different from my father? No, I think I'm rather similar. That's, of course, 
that it, but 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 it's always very amusing. We get more and more like our parents as we get older. And yeah. <laughs> and I notice my son is getting more and more like me. And oh God. <laughs> yeah. That 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 that's life. No, I'm, undoubtedly my children found me a bit cold. I don't feel cold, but kind of intellectual. Yes, certainly they have that. I mean, I've heard that explicitly from one or two of them. Mm -hmm. Not the one of the Betty Buys, uh, the stories. Uh. Well, I love to read to them, and they would crawl into my bed in the morning sometimes. I mean, more in the morning than the evening. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, we could be very close, but not romping around. and. How was Freeman as a father? How would you describe him? I'd have to say, always supportive of what we did. You know, always there to, you know, we knew that what we did, he would be behind us and help us out and, you know, encouraging, but not, you know, guiding, but not, you know, leading, I guess. And does the per person warm, caring, or more the intellectual cold part of the family? Both. <laughs> I think very warm and caring, but maybe not always visibly. <laughs> Is this an understatement? Or <laughs> no, but I mean, I always, you always knew. You always knew it. Even though it might not have been obvious to other people, but you always knew it. But I think other people could see it too. It's a curious paradox that the beauty and consolation provided by children play such a large role in our lives and such a small role in our literature. The literature that we consider great is mostly concerned with dramatic events and extraordinary people. The growth of young children is, by contrast, ordinary. The intellectual awakening of young children is a process as ordinary as the physical awakening of woodland in springtime. Everyone loves the cute remarks of children, just as everyone loves the first flowers of spring. Flowers in spring also bring beauty and consolation, but no great literature is written about flowers. Such ordinary things as babies and flowers don't make themes for great books. Although the process by which a child begins to understand and to ask questions is a deep mystery, perhaps the deepest mystery of all that we see around us, we still consider babies ordinary because we're so familiar with them. Oh, yeah, you can pick it up. It's one of the children, I'm sure. Could be. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Hi. Oh, pretty well? I, I, are you finished with your piano lesson? More or less, just walk in quietly, please. Don't make too much noise. Oh, good. All right. Well, knock at the door at the kitchen and I will know that you're there. Good. Sounds wonderful. I'll talk to you later because I'm... Okay? You were right. Mom, one of the children. This was one of my daughters. One of my children. Uh -huh. yeah. There's one genre of literature in which great books about children can be written. This is the genre of books written for children to read. In a book for children, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. The beauty of the ordinary can be honestly portrayed. The mystery of the ordinary is not hidden. Lewis Carroll was one of the greatest writers for children because he cared passionately for his child friend Alice and he saw the world through her eyes. The world that he saw was absurd and full of paradox because the world that every child sees is absurd and full of paradox. Randall's idea that he would rather be an egg than a chicken is a thought that might easily have occurred to Alice. Humpty Dumpty, the master of logical paradox, was an egg. Carol understood what every child understands, that words are magic. He understood that eggs are also magic, their smooth, round shape hiding the mysteries that give birth to chickens and turtles and dinosaurs. He gave to Humpty Dumpty the insight that words mean whatever you want them to mean. Such an insight would not have occurred to a chicken. What other bubbles did you make? Small bubbles. When you try to make a square one. A square bubble? No. Oh, I don't. No, no, 
It's don't come round. They only come round? Mm -hmm. It didn't turn a square? No. Well, you know, people have tried to make square eggs, but they failed pretty much to a Granddad chicken. Did. So, yeah, <laughs> that's right. And chickens still lay round, lay round eggs. Right? Somewhere. They would like to make them square so they fit in the box better and they don't rattle around so much. But. Another great work of literature written for children is Charlotte's Web. This goes deeper than the Alice books. It deals directly with death. Charlotte dies. White wrote a masterpiece because he was not afraid to look at death through the mind of a child. At the end of tragedy comes consolation. After death comes birth. Charlotte never sees her babies, and her babies never know their mother, but life goes on. A child is able to accept death as a fact of life. Every child more than three years old is aware of death, and most children can speak of it in matter-of-fact words without fear. Two years ago, our little poodle died, and Randall, sitting in his high chair at the supper table, remarked, my bones are feeling heavier and heavier every day. I think I'll be going to heaven soon. Every child to whom we have read Charlotte's Web aloud has loved it. The story is sad, but it is also funny and joyful. Children know that life is like that, a mixture of sorrow and joy. Well, grandchildren and children to me really are the salt of the earth. I, I have, a, uh, you know, without them. I don't know, I mean, my life would be very, very quiet and very uneventful, and these children keep you young, and in fact, they, they have in many ways also been our teachers or my teacher in um, letting me grow up and letting me understand the world and how to cope. Yeah, the best, the best uh, upbringing comes not from one's parents, but from Absol one's successors. Absolutely, I think that's what I believe, that, you know, the children, the children really are the teachers who, who help you in, you know, bringing them up really and making you understand how the world ticks. She is a hunter, roared the lion. God, God is gentle, chirped the robin. He is powerful, growled the bear. And the argument grew louder and louder and louder until, stop, a new voice spoke. It rumbled loudly like thunder and it whispered softly like butterfly sneezes. The voice seemed to come from, why, it seemed to come from Old Turtle. So there's Old Turtle. Old Turtle hardly ever said anything, and certainly never argued about God. But now Old Turtle began to speak. There he's speaking to the whole crowd. There are works also full of beauty and consolation written for adults about children. Richard Hughes was a master of this genre. His best known story, A High Wind in Jamaica, deals with murder. Emily is a resourceful little girl who finds herself accidentally on board a pirate ship in the Caribbean. The pirates are friendly souls who treat her well and mean her no harm. The pirate captain gives her a bed in his own cabin. Then the captain of a Dutch merchantman is captured and put with Emily in the cabin. In a moment of panic, she murders the Dutchman. Arrived back in England, she easily pins the blame for the murder on the pirates. At the court of inquiry, the accused men have no chance of prevailing against her evident innocence. Insouciantly, she walks free, while they are led away to be hanged. Emily shows us the dark side of childhood, the ruthlessness that nature gave us long ago to help us to survive the harsh struggle for existence the cunning that hides ruthlessness behind an innocent face. Every child has a dark side, though not every child commits murder. Emily is true to her nature. She is lovable because it is in our nature as human beings to love children even when they do evil. Children must be ruthless 
and parents must be forgiving. Otherwise, their genes will not survive. Another great book about children is William Golding's Lord of the Flies. Golding shows us an even darker side of childhood. The ruthlessness of a gang is worse than the ruthlessness of a single child. The gang is the natural result of competition for status and power when children are left by themselves on an island without adults to restrain them. The children need strong leadership to survive in a tropical jungle, and the price of strong leadership is blind loyalty and terror. They are trapped between the silence of the jungle and the brutality of the gang. Children still obey the instincts of tribal cohesion that enabled a social animal to survive the hazards of famines and ice ages. Golding's children are as individuals no worse than Emily. They're worse only when they are submerged in the gang. Golding's book tells us deep truths about our children and about ourselves. Even when we do evil, we are not all bad. Golding's children, in the depths of their degradation, are lovable too. There is beauty and consolation in tragedy, not only in stories with happy endings. These children grow on you so much. They are, and you know, when they pay you back and when they come and they slap their fat little hands on your shoulder and they tell you how much they love you or how much they need you, it's all worth it, you know, and I, I wouldn't have it any other way. So I, I think I would pine away if they weren't here. In fact, this little thing here isn't there, and I had him for... It's grandchild. This is, this is one of the grandchildren, yeah that's, yeah, that's the last one. That's Max, who's in California, and mother decided to go back to work after three weeks, and there came the SOS. You have to come, mother. I don't have anybody for the child, you know. And, and there you go. Of course, I hopped on the plane, and, and then I had him all to myself all day long, and it was very nice. It was one child, you know. And it, was, it was absolutely wonderful, so. You're talking like, uh, Freeman's talking like a, a quiet kind of, kind of happy family life. Oh, absolutely. I Completely think that, happy, happy yeah. family life. I think on the whole we really are. I mean, and I must say Freeman, of course, Freeman is... But most people think it's boring to talk about happy families. That's what you, we don't write about happy families. That's there are true. No great it's novels about that, happy yes, families. Yes, why not? Yes, and it's I think more... It's boring you hearing talking no, about all these wonderful kids. More has to be written about happy families. Happy families are the most wonderful thing in the, in the world, you know. It, I, I don't know. And Yet. Freeman, can you imagine that if you hear people talk about their wonderful kids, about them hugging them, uh, getting so much in return for everything you do, uh, and Christmas, all the family is there, that, that, that is a kind of boredom. It's, it's, it's boring to talk about yes, happy family uh, life. Yes, in fact, it's because we both agree that Christmas is a bore. <laughs> Yes, you do it so many times. Because happy family life in general. That's right. Yes. No, yes. Christmas, I mean, because the a, Christmas has become so much of... But that's of, different. Of, of, uh, it, 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 it it's is, two different things. It's two, it's, it's not, that's not family life. It's a sort of it's a charade which we go through every year. And it is, it is in a way, uh, overdone. I'd rather have a much simpler Christmas. But this is what they expect it, and so it just has become... It's a, always done. Yeah. It's become a routine. But the... Uh, no, the, the everyday... Fami family life means much more to me. Tolstoy famously remarked that all happy families are alike, but each unhappy family is, is unhappy in its own way. That's why great books are written about unhappy families. Unhappy families provide tension and drama, the stuff of literature, while happy families only provide a card game for children. It seems to be only in the visual arts that happy families are portrayed as central to the human condition. The Holy Family, centered on the child Jesus, has inspired thousands of great paintings and sculptures. One does not need to be a Christian to feel the joy of the Renaissance painters and the beauty of the masterpieces that they produced. Their religion taught them that this ordinary baby that they painted was the light of the world. Even for those of us to whom the religion is alien, the paintings and the light remain. Uh, did you have tragedies with the children themselves? Or Freeman's son George had a very hard time. You know, he uh, 
it wasn't very easy for him to grow up. In fact, it was very hard. Yes. And, uh, um, it was, it was first of all, a broken family. I mean, it was, you know, that he didn't have his mom here, and uh, and it, but it was also, I I think, the uh, time of of life. You know, the wars and so on, and he he had a very hard time struggling with it all, and you know, and then there came the drugs on the scene, and. You know, at that time, at the beginning, when when the drug problem started, there wasn't an either or. You couldn't say no. Everybody took it. Everybody was in with it, and you know, you would be a complete outsider if you didn't. And mm -hmm. and I think children just just were baffled and, and sort of got pulled into it. And you know, it's uh, now that you so many years later find out what tragedies these drugs really bring, you know, it's it's more possible to teach children, um, you know. Yeah, but the moment you're talking about Freeman's son, yeah. Vietnam, drugs, Yes. Uh, here the story becomes interesting. Yes, ah, yes. Yeah. that's yeah. exactly the point. That was the closest we came to a tragedy. Yes. And it was, in fact, interesting. I mean, that's, it is true that something <laughs> would, would, you could write a book about it. Oh, I, I yes. remember sitting here in this room, having a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him. And he was telling me how wonderful these drugs are yeah. and what, how uh, you're not really alive if you don't take them. And th I couldn't convince him. I mean, you know, he was mm. just absolutely sure he was right and mm -hmm. that I was just an old fuddy-duddy and I didn't understand. And, <laughs> and that's, that's the way it was. And uh, you couldn't argue with him. And in the end, the police picked him up and locked him up, and that was the best thing that ever happened to him because it was a then, rude awakening. Then he saw what it really meant, and, and he was in the juvenile jail with a lot of. How old was he? He was 14. Uh -huh. With a lot of other kids whom he realized immediately had absolutely zero chances that these were uneducated kids who were never going to make it in life. Mm -hmm. And he has immediately realized that's not what he wanted. And uh, so it changed, it changed him around, and oh, not immediately, but... Yeah. But I we were just, we were very lucky. Yeah. That, that he had a kind of opposite mirror of... That he had this, this he, he, he was forced to face realities just because the police actually moved in and... Mm. Otherwise, otherwise wrong. He yeah, might well, have I mean, gone to the easily gone to the bad. I mean, it was a big chance anyway. I mean, it was 50-50 whether he would have gone to the bad or, or not. And but in fact, he became then a, at the age of 16, he was making a life for himself, building boats and and mm -hmm. in love with nature. And uh, he had the great good luck to to b become acquainted with David Brower was yeah. the leader of the environmentalists. You know, he ran the Sierra Club at that time, and and, and George sort of became a substitute son for him, and he became a substitute father for mm -hmm. George in a way. And he lived in the Brower family for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the most important things. I yes. think finding the right people, I think, is, is and so he could outside of the family. He had this enormous respect for David Brower, which was quite, mer I mean, David Brower is a great man, and and he stood for everything that George believed in, and he wasn't his father, so it went it went very well. And, mm -hmm. and poor old David Brower had three sons, which he didn't get along with, and <laughs> <laughs> so George was the son he would have liked to have had. And <laughs> mm. But can you remember um, <clears throat> your son coming home, being sent to jail, drugs? What was your reaction? Because you had your ideas about George and his upbringing and what he should become. Uh, now there's a son going to jail, 14 years old. Yeah, we talked, of course, very, very heavily over this. I mean, it was it was a very hard choice. We had to make the choice whether to leave him in jail or to try to get him out and get hire a lawyer and we decided quite a, 
together to let him sit there. Yeah, I mean, it sounded terribly cruel, and I think that's the one time we both shed tears. But yes, uh, it was very, very hard, but, but it certainly was the right decision, as it turned out. And yeah. To be kind, you have to be cruel. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. But, it's just, it's but that's the only, ca the only ca case in the whole family of, of, of anything close to a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. God is, is indeed it, uh, deep. Is yes, God the turtle is now speaking. Because he's speaking God is indeed deep, she said to the fish in the sea. And much higher than high, she Bay. told the mountains. He is swift and free as the wind and still and solid as a great rock, she said to the breezes and stones. She is the life of the world, turtle said to the willow, always close by yet beyond the farthest twinkling light, she told the ant and the star. God is gentle and powerful above all things and within all things. God is all that we dream of and all that we seek, said old turtle. All that we come from and all that we can find, God is. Old turtle had never said so much before. All the beings of the world were surprised and became very quiet. But old turtle had one more thing to say. Freeman? The quote we're talking about. You can pick it up. Oh, I'm sorry, which quote was that? Yeah, you were. What were we talking about? Our short term memories. Yes, no, you were, uh, you were asking me. What were we talking about? About God? Yes. Whether uh, Weinberg said science would not give any consolation in facing death, and yeah. I said, yes, I agree with that. No, I think the main consolation one has to feel, I mean, everybody's scared of dying, everybody's scared of getting sick. There are all sorts of things which scare me to death. And consolation mostly just comes from companionship, that as soon as you th somehow manage to stop thinking of yourself and t t think of a group of people and we're all in it together, that's, that's the, the consolation. That's why I find family is of central importance. in some way that dying is an important part of being a grandfather. And that in some way it makes sense to die if you're a grandfather. It makes you less scared if you think of it that way. And that certainly has nothing to do with science and not much to do with religion. Are you from time to time as afraid as Freeman sometimes is about dying? No, I don't, I don't think I am. I, I really, I always just felt, you know, I, I, it would be very selfish to think that I couldn't die because everybody else dies and, and it's just, you know, my, one day it's my turn and that's just it. Um, I, would, I would feel very unhappy if I died at a time when my children still need, need me. I would like to die at a time when I feel I've done absolutely all they can, and they are now fine, and they are on their own, and 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 now I'm not needed. And at that point, you know, I, I feel very privileged then to live a little bit longer, maybe, but I, I, I don't mind at that point, I think. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, if if I now we are medically told that, that maybe I do have only a short time to live, I might feel very differently about it. Then I probably, you know, you hear that so often that um, suddenly when you're actually confronted with it, you do, you do change your mind and, mm -hmm. you know, you, have to. you become, you have to, of course. And I mean, there are stages of dying. People who take such a long time to die, they very often are totally resigned 
to this, and and the case in point is is Alice's friend, um, Jose. Yes. And Jose was suddenly turned with cancer, and at the beginning, was perfectly resigned. She was an extremely pious person, and so she simply told everybody that she was going to heaven. She never said, I'm dying. She simply said, I'm going to heaven soon, you know. But as the disease advanced, she suddenly realized this is it, this is real. And she became very different and uh, and resented it. Why is it me and why can't I live? I'm not old enough and, you know, just, just the way people go through these stages. And and then then she became very demanding something she had never been in her life at all. She, and, and finally, I, I, I guess, I don't know, she probably became very peaceful before she died. I, I didn't see her again. And Are you really reconciling with the fact that you, sooner or later now, will push the daisies? Well, it depends, of course, what you mean by reconciled. I mean, of course, intellectually, it's clear this is going to happen, but still one is scared, and that's part of being human, that we have this, as far as we know, unique ability to foresee our own deaths. And mm -hmm. That's always been a big part of being human. How frightening is it for you? Well, quite frightening in times, but of course one doesn't think about it very often. When you think about it? I mean, at the moment it happens that, that the boy's other grandfather is dying of cancer, and that's of course something we think about quite a lot. And so, so it is somehow, that brings it close, when somebody you know well is dying. Of course, I reached the time of life when many of my friends start dying off. One of my closest friends died a few months ago. So it's part of it's part of living. There's no doubt about it. And yeah. As you get older, it gets more it gets more imminent. And That's the fact. Yes, it's That's true. That's the science part of it. But yes, and I think. It, 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 it makes it easier to be a grandfather simply because that is the expected role of a grandfather. That You're going to die. You're going to die. Not that it won't take so terribly long. I mean, grandfathers don't hang around forever. But you're rationalizing, rationalizing now, or as you yes, of talk course. about your role as a grandfather. Yes, and of course, in, 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 in fact, I mean, if I wake up in the night and feel scared, You just you just have to to live with that, and you just have to say to yourself, no point of living if you're only scared all the time and wasting your time. Perhaps. Yes, you better, better while you're alive. You better just think about other things, and that's of course the way to deal with it. Do you manage to get over it? Yes. It takes five minutes, an hour, three hours? Well, it varies, of course, but I mean, generally not so long. I mean, it is for me, well, maybe at the worst, a day or two. And a day or two? Yes. Worrying about, Worrying about the fact that you're not going to escape. Yes, I mean, it, but it's, it's, I mean, it's always associated with some particular malady. If I, I think I'm. I think I'm getting Alzheimer's, or I'm thinking I'm getting one or, not, one or another kind of cancer or something. You know that, that that's what happens. Then after a while, you come to your senses and you find out that after all, you're quite healthy. Mm -hmm. But this idea that there was a a universe of time before you. There will be a universe of time after you. And in between there was Freeman Dyson for a split second. And the world goes on without him. How, whatever you do with your definition of time, 
Yeah. Yes. This is the frightening idea. No, that's certainly not. No, this that is to the me, consoling idea. That's consoling. Yes. I mean, the fact that after all, I'm part of a much bigger process. That that I'm I'm one of a great crowd of people who are really doing important things. To me, that's consoling and. I'm I'm laying one brick in the cathedral, so to speak. And Freeman said something about he was rationalizing mm -hmm. that being a grandfather was reconciling him with his own dad. Uh, grandfathers are dying, yeah? yeah. They are supposed to be dying. Yeah. Do you have the same feeling that life is ending at the same time you become a grandmother? I don't know. It it certainly makes you very much aware of it when you become a grandmother, you know, that, that, that life will end. And yes, the more they grow, I guess I, I, I feel that way. Um, again, there's, there's such a nice thing to know that, that they live on and that they are there, you know, and that they are part of you that stays behind and maybe feels and does what you had done. Do you really mean that? Because... I think that this stuff of, well, uh, they go on and they're part of me and so I'm consoled by the fact that there's continuation uh, and I will. Oh, well, is I it mean really true or is this a rationalization? Well, probably a rationalization, but um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that, that, that that I feel, well, all right, it's time for me to go, and I want to go. I certainly <laughs> don't. I mean, you know, I'm much too curious. I'd, I always say to Freeman, well, it's really shucks now. There are all these new things being invented and done, and there will be a time when I won't see what goes on. And in fact, after my father and my sister died, that's what I felt most strongly. I wanted to scream and let them know, you know, all these things have happened, and you didn't see it, you know. It's, yeah. I mean, certainly... Um, you know, in that way, I would, I would certainly like to keep on living, for sure. And but old oh, Turtle had oh. one more thing to say. There will soon be a new family of beings in the world, she said, and they will be strange and wonderful. They will be reminders of all that God is. They will come in many colors and shapes. So there are the new creatures coming. People. Right, is that what it is? with different faces and different ways of speaking. Their thoughts will soar to the stars, but their feet will walk the earth. They will possess many powers. They will be strong yet tender, a message of love from God to the earth, and a prayer from the earth back to God. And the people came. Look there, look how many there are. But the people forgot. They forgot that they were a message of love and a prayer from the earth. And they began to argue about who knew God and who did not, and where God was and was not, and whether God was or was not. And often the people misused their powers and hurt one another or killed one another, and they hurt the earth, until finally even the forests began to die. That's what happened when they started to fight each other. And the rivers and the oceans and the plants and the animals and the earth itself, because the people could not remember who they were or where God was. Until one day there came a voice like the growling of thunder, but soft as butterfly sneezes. Please, stop! The voice seemed to come from the mountain who rumbled. Sometimes I see God swimming in the dark blue depths of the sea. And from the ocean who sighed, he is often among the snow-capped peaks reflecting the sun. From the stone who said, I sometimes feel her breath as she blows by. And from the breeze who whispered, I feel his still presence as I dance among the rocks. And the star declared, God is very close. And the island added, His love touches everything. 
And after a long, lonesome and scary time, the people listened and began to hear and to see God in one another and in the beauty of all the earth. And old turtle smiled. Oh. And so did God. That's right. Okay. It would be idiotic to think that the whole universe centers around this particular species. As we know we're only one out of millions of species and that there's no reason to believe we're the last word in any sense. And on the other hand, I mean, if you, if you regard us as meaning living creatures with some kind of intelligence, then I would say, on the whole, I would say that, that uh, it does look as though the universe had that in mind. I mean, that, that it should be hospitable to life and hospitable to intelligence. So it's just a question of what you mean. It, it, I, I, I think I mean, you, you can say that the universe has some kind of a purpose to become aware of itself. We are the vehicles to understand. Well, no, we're not the, we're not the, we're, we're just one of the possible attempts. and We're not the vehicle. We're probably one of many. And, and But the, the fact that the universe may be sort of in, in some way groping to become aware of itself, I find this a, 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 a quite likely to be true, and it's certainly an appealing idea. And there's nothing in the laws of science that contradicts that. That doesn't imply that, that the human beings have a special place. It, It implies that maybe we do have some responsibilities. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> I know what you're <laughs> flying away, huh? Yes, I mean that that colonizing the universe. Yes, it may be in some sense that that we are the, the at a strategic place in the whole. As it happens, just for sort of. For, accidental reasons. But if it wasn't us, it would probably be somebody else. And <laughs> Twenty years ago, I attempted to set down in words a vision of beauty and consolation that came to me in a dream. The dream came in the night of July the 6th, 1977. I wrote first an unedited version of the dream as I remembered it. Then I wrote an edited version, which was published in the concluding chapter of my book, Disturbing the Universe. For artistic reasons, I decided to give the book a quiet ending. I did not wish the book to end with a shout of joy. The architecture of the book required that it end with a nocturne rather than a capriccio. So the edited version of the dream was muted. Here is the unedited version, written down while memory was fresh. I have been complaining for years to lower level officials and there's never been any response. Why don't you go straight to the top, says my wife. If I were you, I would just telephone the head office. So I pick up the phone and dial the number. Everybody in our family knows that I'm a coward on the telephone. Usually I make all kinds of excuses to avoid making a call, especially when it's to somebody I don't know. But this time is different. I take the plunge without hesitation. To my amazement, the secretary answers at once in a friendly voice and asks what I want. I say I'd like an appointment. She says, good, I put you down for Friday at five. I say, may I bring the children? She says, of course. As I put down the phone, I realize that today is Friday and we have only a few hours to get ourselves ready. I ask the children if they want to come. I tell them if we're, that we're going to talk to God and they'd better behave themselves. 
Only Emily and Rebecca are interested. In a way, I'm glad not to have the whole crowd on my hands. So we say goodbye to the others quickly before they have time to change their minds. It's just Emily and Rebecca and me. We slip out of the house quietly and walk across town to the office. The office is a large building, rather like a church, but without any roof. Looking upward, we see the building goes up and up like an elevator shaft forever. We hold hands and jump off the ground and go zooming up the shaft. I look at my watch. I see we have only a few minutes until five o'clock. Luckily, we're zooming up very fast, and it looks as if we shall be on time. Just as my watch says five, we arrive at the top of the shaft and walk out into an enormous throne room. The room has whitewashed walls and heavy oak beams. At the side facing us is the throne, a huge dark wooden affair with wicker back and sides. I walk slowly toward the throne. The two girls follow behind a little nervously. The throne is at the top of a flight of steps. From below it looks empty. I look at my watch again. Probably God didn't expect us to be so punctual. Anyway, we can wait here till he comes. After a few more minutes, I decide to climb the steps and have a closer look at the throne. The girls are shy and stay at the bottom. I walk up, and when I get to the top step, my eyes are level with the seat. I see then that the throne is not empty after all. There is a baby looking as if he's about three months old, lying there on the seat and smiling at me. I pick him up and show him to the girls. They run up the steps and take turns with me carrying him in their arms. I lift him up to my face and kiss his mouth. A flood of overwhelming peace and joy pours into me. I hold him for a few minutes longer, knowing that the questions I had intended to raise with him have been answered. Then I put him gently back on his throne and say goodbye. The girls hold my hands again, and we walk down the steps together. The image of God as a three month old, for you, is the ultimate expression of beauty and consolation. In a way, yes. I mean, that, that I think is true, that it's not only just a beautiful picture, but it also may be something real, that, that, that God is young, the universe is young, and... We have to help him. Yes. That everything is just at the beginning. He did, doesn't know what he started. Exactly. He doesn't know any more than we do. And that, I think, has some meaning, quite apart from the beauty of it. And There's a, a man called John Horgan who just has written a famous book called The End of Science, which created a great stir. And my son remarked when somebody asked him about this book, and he says, my son said, how can he know so much about the end of science when we're so close to the beginning? And that's the way I feel also about life in general. We know so little. Yes, we're just at the beginning, and that, that applies to everything we do, and, and even to God. 